Principal funding for Meet the Past with Crosby Kemper III is provided by the Courtney S. Turner Charitable Trust, with additional financial support from Ken and Cindy McLean of Independence, Missouri, and by these fine organizations. What if you could step back in time and talk with some of Kansas City's most historic figures? The innovators and achievers who left their mark on our town, on our nation. What would you ask if you could meet the past? This week, Crosby stops the presses with William Rockhill Nelson, the founder of the Kansas City Star and principal benefactor of the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art. I wish to thank uh, Mia Paris, the, the current publisher of the Kansas City Star, uh, as we welcome. 132 years later, the founding publisher and editor of the Kansas City Star, builder of Kansas City, advisor and scourge of presidents, <clears throat> creator of the most important newspaper between St. Louis and San Francisco, William Rockhill Nelson. Crosby, thank you, thank you. <clears throat> it's wonderful to be with you this evening. I appreciate your invitation. And I remember this bank, so it's good to be back. It's very hot. Well, Speaking of hot, when I first came to Kansas City, whenever it would rain a lot, the streets were a sea of mud. And when it was hot like this, it was a desert of dust. The, the big question is why, in 1880, you were 39 years old. Right. You and your partner, Mr. Morse, came with $3,000. Why did you come to Kansas City? I'm told that you considered going other places. Um, Kansas City, this is where Lewis and Clark camped. This is where the Oregon, Santa Fe, and California trails left from in 1880. Because of Chanute's Bridge, the Hannibal Bridge, the first permanent span over the Missouri River, it made Kansas City potentially an important transportation hub. Also, there was a lot of capital being invested from the East Coast. So I saw a future here, and I didn't think the papers were very good. There were three dailies, and that was very attractive to us. But when I saw Kansas City, I realized if I was going to live here, I was going to make it over. <laughs> and I mentioned the streets, and that's why paving was our first objective of the, of the star. There were very few paved streets here, and only a few uh, wooden plank sidewalks. So, also, there was a building boom that was beginning to happen in the 80s, and Kansas City had been incorporated as a city in 1880. And, and so, with your $3,000, you and Mr. Morse found a, a paper, the Kansas mm -hmm. City, the Evening Star, the Evening Star. Uh, as it was at the time, almost immediately getting 3,000 subscribers. It was which amazing. Is, which was quite extraordinary. Even so, they, they made fun of you. Eugene yeah, Field, Field, he the, said, Twinkle, twinkle, little star, bright and gossipy you are. We can daily hear you speak for a paltry dime a week. Paltry dime, dime. Because we charge two cents and continue to charge two cents. Uh, the other dailies charged five cents. So we, you're right. We rapidly had a pretty good circulation. But you had a vision for the city. You said you were going to be absolutely independent in mm -hmm, politics. Mm -hmm. That was important, mm -hmm. which probably hadn't happened in Kansas City. Independent, nonpartisan, but never neutral. You came about the same time that, uh, that Jim Pendergast arrived from St. Joseph. Yeah, and actually later on, and we hopefully will talk about that, we actually worked together on a few things. And you also said you were wholly free, that the star would be wholly free to labor for the, this is from the first editorial mm -hmm. of the star, in the interests of the people. But you were, later on, you were called a plutocrat by mm -hmm. some. You became very, very wealthy. Mm -hmm. and, and yet, you, you said you had the interests of the people at heart. My friends called me colonel, and that was by agreement. My enemies called me baron. And your enemies are a certificate of your character. You, you had plenty of certification. You had lots of enemies and all the right, <laughs> all the right enemies. I, I, may I read this short uh, thing? It was in the first editorial that uh, we wrote, I wrote the paper, education languages, mud blockades the road to the Little Red Schoolhouse. Literature must have circulation or be impotent. Art cannot ennoble or uplift or delight the multitude it cannot reach. So even in 1880, I mentioned the word art, having no idea what was down the road. 
and they would be paved roads. Right. You, you mentioned art. You also mentioned the mud and education. Mm -hmm. and, and you also said later on that, that the star, and you said this to your reporters, was for the 30,000 serious readers, even when, you're, when the paper got to be 150,000, mm -hmm. which in terms of the population of the city must have been the highest per capita circulation of any paper in the United States. Correct. But you said it was for the 30,000 serious readers, but you also said the paper was for all classes and conditions, right. Republicans, Democrats, right. prohibitionists. The prohibitionists, Farmers, Farmers Alliance, Alliance, white men and black men, Protestants, Catholics, and free thinkers, yes. Native Americans, naturalized foreigners, businessmen, and professional men. And, and interesting that you, you did leave out one group, I notice, women. Yeah, we had to protect the ladies. You, you, you said at, at one point that you, you, were, you were free to be inconsistent mm -hmm. on specific issues, but you had one permanent thing that, that the paper would always represent, the interests of Kansas City. The interests of Kansas City, interests of the people. I felt that the Star, and quite frankly, all papers, should be the lookout on the ship estate. And that was what I was trying to achieve. Yeah, your circulation grew and grew, and you, you eventually became a larger, double the size mm -hmm. of all other newspapers in, in Kansas City combined. But it wasn't always an easy road. I mean, you, you attack the leading citizens of Correct. Kansas City. There's a story mm -hmm. about, uh, it's a good story that I'd like you to tell about Kersey Coates, who was the, in some ways the leading citizen of Kansas City, who you almost immediately in your editorial pages yeah. criticized. Well, and actually did criticize. The year after I came here, I met Ida Houston, a lovely lady from Champaign, Illinois, and we were married. And she had a dowry of $50,000. Now, you said at one point, you said that a publisher should have uh, no wife, right. no child, so I wasn't, and no property. That's true. Well, that all changed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we lived in an apartment on the edge of Quality Hill, and then we moved into Kersey Coates Hotel. And this is after the first location for the star. We were going to get a different location, and we needed a new press. And the Armor Bank wouldn't give it to us. But you'd said about Kersey Coates and the Opera House. Yes, I at had. At the beginning, in the, right, the, the I first had year. That, that, that they needed fire exits. The, the seating was poor. There were a number of problems with the You're afraid Opera it would burn down, which, uh, by yes. the way, eventually happened. It did, right. But he was kind and of. And he was angry. To, he, he was, was angry, angry at you. He me. came and attacked he you. But he, he said He said the real reason was you wanted ads from him, and, and, <laughs> and he wouldn't give you ads, so you attacked him. Well, he, he agreed with me. He made the corrections, and he gave me the loan. He co signed the loan with he the Armour the Bank. Loan. Yes. The Armour Packing Bank. And uh, we had family, got a new press bank. and continually moved forward. You, you always had self-confidence, and tell us a little bit about your background, okay. about coming, your Indiana boyhood, and coming to Kansas City. Self-confidence was never one of my failings. <laughs> I can tell you that. I was born in March 1841 in Indiana. My great-grandfather had fought in the American Revolution. My grandfather was probably the first man in these United States to plant 1,000 acres of corn. Um, I was a, somewhat of a rascal, and my father sent me to Notre Dame. I called that the botany for bad boys. You were boys. a Protestant, but he sent you to Notre Dame. To a thought, Catholic school. Catholic school. He thought maybe the priests could, could uh, shape you up. Shape me up. Did and, they? Well, I, they asked me to leave after two years. Apparently not. <laughs> Okay. And you did, you, did, you did what, yes, what anyone I, rusticated from uh, Notre Dame would do, you studied, studied when it went law, into the law. passed the bar, yes. and when the Civil War was over, which I did not participate in, at the urging of my father, um, a friend and I went south and bought a cotton plantation and a general store in Savannah, and unfortunately the price of cotton plummeted. And we went out of business, came back to uh, Fort Wayne, and I, my father was in the building business and the real estate development business. So I worked in that, but I also decided, and this was a major turning point in my life, I decided that I wanted to get into politics. I wanted to change the world and do good things. The man running for president in 1976 was Samuel J. Tilden, governor of New York. He went after the Tweed ring. He put a boss Tweed behind bars. He said that honest elections are crucial for democratic government. I liked him very much. I became chair of the Tilden campaign in Indiana statewide. And unfortunately, election day, when election day came, he had the popular vote. But there were disputed electoral votes in Florida, <laughs> South Carolina, 
and Texas. And they're still uh, writing about disputed votes uh, in Florida. Are they? Mr. Nelson, yes. I, well, I hope it's that still, never yeah. would have happened again. No, it's uh, but sorry. There it's still was a congressional us. committee appointed, and there were five Republicans and four Democrats. So the election went to Rutherford Burchard Hayes. Well, I was so disheartened, I thought, this is not the way I'm going to go. What I'm going to do, I'm going to combine paper and ink with ideas. I'm going to run a newspaper. So for two years, my friend and I operated the Fort, Fort Wayne, Wayne Sentinel. Sentinel. And, and then... And then your other partner down in Savannah, who right. had started a general store, and you unfortunately co-signed loans mm -hmm. with him. This is, as a former banker, I have to tell you, never... <laughs> never, never do that. that. And, and well, you, you lost... know, I used to say bankers give me cankers. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> So you lost all your money except for the money you had in the Fort Wayne Sentinel, Mr. Yeah. Nelson. I don't usually laugh this much. You, mm -hmm. you sell the Fort Wayne Sentinel, $3,000, all you have left after having made literally hundreds mm -hmm. of thousands of dollars in the contracting business. You come to Kansas City and you start this great newspaper. It's, a, it's the great age of newspapers. It's the age of Pulitzer. The golden age of journalism. The golden age of journalism, Pulitzer and Hearst. But you run a kind of different newspaper. Right. You don't do the sensational things. No, I was opposed do. to yellow journalism. Matter of fact, during the Spanish-American War and events leading up to it, and then of course the Maine was blown up in Havana Harbor and Hearst was remembered well, the Maine. The famous story of course about Hearst is that he sent Frederick Remington to Cuba mm -hmm. to do pictures of the war in Cuba to, to, to sensationalize it and Remington sends him a telegram and says there's no war so I can't do any pictures and Hearst sends a telegram back and says you supply the pictures I'll supply the, the war. And that's what he did. That's what he did. Uh, I did not believe in that that kind of uh, newsprint and my advice was don't always believe what you read in the newspaper. Pretty amazing for a publisher. Um, you were very straightforward in the way you published the newspaper. The, the Pulitzer and Hearst papers were doing graphics and comics, <laughs> but you believed in good writing. Uh -huh. You believed very much Absolutely. in good writing. We had some you had wonderful some of the great writers. William Allen White was Al a cub Alfred reporter Lewis. for you. T.W. Johnston, Johnson. who get, uh, George Creel, who eventually became the first mm -hmm. propaganda chief of the American mm -hmm. government for Woodrow Wilson, and many, mm -hmm. many other people. Mm -hmm. and, and it was said that you, you, you treated your staff well. You never paid them terribly well. but you No one ever left. No one ever died. No one ever got fired. And uh, no one ever quit. There the newspaper were long business has changed a little bit yeah. since then. My perspective to coming into journalism was a little different than most journalists or people that work in the papers. I was 39 years old when I entered journalism. So I came to journalism from the viewpoint of the reader. And that's a different perspective. It, you, you said you, you didn't want any literary essays in the star, but you put Balzac and Thackeray right. stories on the front page. They said that I p put more Henry James in the paper than Jesse James. <laughs> The main thing about the Kansas City Star in the, in the early days and, and perhaps throughout your entire tenure at the Star is you were a crusader for reform. You, you went after the monopolies. Uh, the streetcar. The streetcar monopoly in particular. There were that was 1,200 columns against the Metropolitan Streetcar. Eventually against against we, they're getting 30, 30 year mm -hmm. uh, uh, get, Franchise. franchises yeah. from the city. We were able to uh, have some success in that and then it turned around against us. And the gas monopoly, you called William Allen White as a cub reporter into your office at one point and asked him if, if he knew anything about the gas monopoly. And he said no. And he said, will you be the perfect reporter for me? Then go out and study right. it. Exactly. Had him study it for, for months to come back and, and tell you that indeed it was too expensive. That's and you fought the gas monopoly. for. And that's another thing. I felt that the most important person working on the newspaper was the reporter. Mm -hmm. You also crusaded uh, against uh, City Hall frequently. There mm -hmm. was a change back and forth between Republicans mm -hmm. and Democrats, the Pendergast Democrats mm -hmm. in particular, the Rabbits and the Goats, mm -hmm. the two Democratic factions were fighting over Pen And Joe Shannon Ruling and Tom, Jim Pendergast. Jim Pendergast. You, you were against the ignorant peddlers of whiskey aspiring to the city council, a direct allusion to, uh, to Jim Pendergast, who'd started a, a sal in a saloon in the West Bottoms. Well, you know, the city council decided they wanted to pass a bill and said that uh, any saloon keeper could not run for office. And Pendergast said, well, I can understand that. They don't want saloon keepers to be tainted with politics. 
But, and, and we should talk about the parks and boulevards. Well, this, and that's the interesting mm -hmm. question because with the parks and boulevards, you worked with Jim Pendergast. Absolutely. He was one of your most important allies. Mm -hmm. When you, the park board, when we went to the council to get this finally on the, after we got George Kessler to come here. So uh, you found George, Kessler. I found Kessler, brought him here. He worked on Hyde Park. He was going to, he did out, outline our parks and boulevards. He was a remarkable man. And we finally got things organized and we went to the council and by one vote it was passed. And that one vote was Alderman Jim Pendergast. This was an example where the paper worked with him. He also cooperated with us in ending the, getting rid of the Union Depot in the West Bottoms and building the Union Station where it is today. And he gave up a lot to push that through. Well, the, all he the houses, the shanty houses right. that were on the side of, uh, of where West Terrace Park, Quality Hill, uh, <laughs> overlooking the West Bottoms, all those were his voters in the first exactly. ward. And, and he they were all torn down from and the park. And, so he lost of course, a lot he of found money. them wherever they moved, That's uh, right. apparently. <laughs> and you were building the star at the same time. You, you, the circulation was double. And that's another thing. The circulation, we had circulation throughout the Southwest, Arizona, New Mexico, uh, Colorado, Kansas, from Iowa down to Texas. It was a huge circulation. You created a weekly paper that was essentially an agricultural For paper farmers. That throughout the territory. And in 1901, we bought from Field the Morning Times. So we had the morning paper, the evening paper, the weekly for the farmers, and then, of course, a Sunday edition. And famously, you built the first building, or so it was said at the, at the time, the first building. For a newspaper. Exclusively for a newspaper, $125,000. Henry Van Brunt. Van Brunt. Henry Van Brunt, the architect, and it had plate, beautiful plate, big mm -hmm. plate glass windows right. uh, on the ground floor through which you could, you could see, see the, the presses. presses. I saw his work at the Columbian Exposition in 1893, and uh, he, he also later worked on my house, too. And, and oh, you'll, you'll be delighted to know that the star continues that tradition. Their printing house uh, today, also a large glass enclosed uh, building from you which mean you can see the presses. down at 14th and Grand? Down, down, down there, yes, at 14th and Grand. That well, that was building. Jarvis Hunt. He was a great architect, Italianate Renaissance That's your 18th and Grand. Yes. Well, he's a and that Hunt was built yes. in um, 1903, but it was Italianate Renaissance Revival. And he also was our architect to build Union Station. I brought him here from Chicago. And so we're talking about art and architecture now. Let's talk about your interest in, in, in art. Uh, Mrs. Nelson and I took a number of trips to Europe and became familiar with the museums and developed a, uh, an appreciation for art. But prior to that and in between that, there was a gentleman in Kansas City. His name was Charles Ripley. He was the founding father of visual arts in Kansas City. In 1887, he created the Art Association and School of Design. And in that building, he had reproductions of famous art. Not a lot, he had some. I had given him money for it, and uh, Mr. Meyer had given him from Now, by 1893, it had burned to the ground. And then in 1897, you come back from Paris and you start your own collection, which is a fabulous collection of, 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 of true masters. That was art in my home. Your art in your home, yeah. including Constable, Gainsborough and Monet. Monet and which you can see hanging in the Nelson, in the Nelson, in yeah. the Nelson Museum Ooh. today. But for the Western Gallery of Art, the successor to Ripley's uh, mm -hmm. Museum, you created a great collection of uh, uh, copies. copies of old masters Mostly and through, sculpture. through the Pisani family in Florence. We spent about $50,000, and some of the copies that we actually acquired were 100 years old already. You, say, you said at one point about architecture and art, that if, it, if it's lasted 100 years, it must be good. That's true. This led to your <laughs> ultimately a uh, giving your estate, mm -hmm. when the, ultimately the star was sold, a large amount of money mm -hmm. uh, to, to found the museum, the Nelson. Well, yes, and it would be a, a remiss if I didn't mention Mary McAfee Atkins, who in 1911 died and left $300,000 that eventually grew into $700,000. Uh, then I left $12 million for the acquisition of art, and Mrs. Nelson and our daughter and son-in-law and our lawyer, Frank Rosell, all of these legacies Kirkland's came together on December 11th, 1933, 
and we have this magnificent museum. Well, it's a great gift of yours to the city. It is in a place that was a little bit surprising at the time because it's where you built your home, Oak Hall. You had a, had a kind of English, if you pardon the expression, baronial view, and you built your, great, <laughs> your own great home on Brush Creek, hence the Baron of Brush Creek. You bought many hundreds of, of acres true. out, out there, true. out south. And built a lot of homes there. And built, and built many homes, mm -hmm. the stone homes that are sometimes today mm -hmm. called the Nelson Homes, which many of your employees uh, from the star. In, inhabited. So you, you, you became a developer, which you had mm -hmm. been in Indiana in your, in your earlier my career. My happiest work were building homes. And you also became very friendly at that point with another famous Kansas Cityan. Absolutely, J.C. Ingalls. Ours. I had tremendous respect for him because he was building just west of where I was building, and I knew the city was in good uh, in good shape with him here in the future. And, and, and you were both great builders, and, and it was a, an era of great builders. Mm -hmm. and there's there's a great moment in your career, in Kansas City's career, about that time, 1900, 1900 mm -hmm. the Convention Hall, mm -hmm. and you you had and the paper had done everything you could in 1899 to build this Convention Hall. The Democratic Party was going to have its national convention, mm -hmm. the first national convention in Kansas City in 1900, and then it burns down, down. 90 days before the Democratic mm -hmm. National Convention. And what did you do? And well, we build it back up, like in 90 days. The 90-day miracle. We build it, 90-day miracle. miracle. And now the only unfortunate thing about that is the Democratic Party nominated William James Bryant. Oops. For a second time, and I didn't care for him. I was a progressive not a populist. Your, your <laughs> politics are very interesting in, in this period because, as you say, you're anti-populist, pro-progressive, <laughs> and, and Mark Sullivan, the great muckraking journalist and historian, said, progressive movement in the Midwest centered in the Kansas City Star, mm -hmm. a blend of Hamiltonian socialism mm -hmm. and Jeffersonian anarchy. I don't yeah. know what that means. Yeah, well, I always called myself a Jeffersonian Democrat, but I also, people said I was a Democrat that never voted Democrat. So. But you become enamored. Of, of one of the great figures in American history. You get Theodore to know Roosevelt. Theodore Roosevelt. Absolutely. He was a remarkable man, and he evolved and changed. Certainly when he came here to Osawatomie and talked about how bad the situation was where corporations were giving so much money to campaigns. <laughs> terrible. And that terrible whole idea. Osawatomie speech was remarkable. It um, sounds like you. He said uh, he was in favor of the, the equality of opportunity and the destruction of, of special privilege. He said mm -hmm. the true fund of property, the true conservative is he who insists that property shall be the servant, not the master right. of the commonwealth. Right. Mm -hmm. And it Absolutely. was actually, the speech was actually written by your former cub reporter, R William, William Allen White. White. Yeah, yeah. I love it. So it was him. really your speech uh -huh. in many well, ways. Well, we agreed, and uh, TR was a guest in my home many times. We both loved Shakespeare, so he would sit and look when through When he first all my came lives. into your house, he immediately went to, to your library, library and started right. taking the Greek classics right. off, he, off the wall. He said, yeah, he'd like to stay there a while. But then 1912 comes along. And, and there are three, three presidents, mm -hmm. all of whom at one point or another you support. Mm -hmm. uh, Woodrow Wilson's running for president as a Democratic candidate. Taft, of course, the running incumbent. for re-election as the incumbent. And he, Teddy Roosevelt starts the, the Bull Miss Party, mm -hmm. the Progressive Party. And you abandon this neutrality that you've mm -hmm. always had, your party neutrality, to actually endorse Roosevelt. And the Progressive Party. Yeah. yeah. That's even, true chaired the Progressive Party in the state of Missouri. That's correct, the, I did. The convention mm -hmm. was in Kansas City mm -hmm. and was run by star reporters. Mm -hmm. It was Ooh. a wonderful time, and I had great hope that that's the way our country would be going, and that we'd get rid of these other parties at that point in time, because I was pretty disheartened with how things were going in the country. And it didn't turn out that way, and then I went and became friends with Woodrow Wilson. In, in the last couple of years of your life, in 1913, 1914, 1915, uh, uh, the Pendergast machine uh, actually comes, begins to, 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 to reach its apotheosis where they control uh, the government of Kansas City. They get rid of the Board of Public Welfare. But in Kansas City, it's a, it's a tough time for reform. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but you felt, even, even so, towards the end, that it was still worth the fight. Absolutely. Uh, you said there, there's always the permanent thing that the star will work for, and the star is never itself a loser because it's fighting for the permanent thing, which is the interests of Kansas City. And the interests of the people, the paper for the people. Do you remember at the very end, the doctors were keeping you alive with mm -hmm. a saline solution, and you finally I'd say, take said, it all. take it off. And I had lost my eyesight. Some of the uh, fellows from the newspaper would come over to O'Call and read me the news. 
but I was still kind of dictating. And you had, you had phones installed in every room so mm -hmm. you could make your hourly call to the star to, to the check star, out. Yeah. Check out. It, your last words, which were to your son-in-law, Erwin Kirkwood, who was helping take mm -hmm. care of you in O'Call, uh, you whispered these words to Kirkwood, remind the men at the office of one thing, the interests that are against Kansas City are still in control. The fight on them mustn't let up, no matter if they say, nice things about me. <laughs> <laughs> and so, death comes as it must to mm -hmm. all men for William Rockhill Nelson on April 13th, 1915. <laughs> all three presidents whom you had advised, supported, and opposed, Teddy Roosevelt, William Howard Taft, and Woodrow Wilson sent tributes. Perhaps the greatest tribute happened a couple of years after your death. Uh, the first job that President Roosevelt held after being president and the last job that President Roosevelt uh, held was as a columnist for the Kansas for the City Star, Star yeah. with he an had, actual yeah. desk. He had a, a, TR came to work for the Star after he left the White House and his office in New York was in the Star's office. William Allen White wrote in Collier's, Mr. Nelson literally gave color to the life and thought and aspirations of 10 millions of people living between the Missouri River and the Rio Grande. He and they were dreaming states and building them. He gathered and voiced the latent visions of these people and gave them conscious form. You found our city mud and left it marble. William Rockhill Nelson. Thank you. Thank you. That was great. William Rockhill Nelson definitely is one of the found founders of Kansas City with his paper and all the great things it did and how it made our city grow and the beautiful city, the green, clean city it is, has a lot to do with William Rockhill Nelson and his paper. Uh, he devoted his last half of his life to this city. He was, it was the golden age of journalism and he was practically the golden part of that. Principal funding for Meet the Past with Crosby Kemper III is provided by the Courtney S. Turner Charitable Trust, with additional financial support from Ken and Cindy McLean of Independence, Missouri, and by these fine organizations.